may be seated, you may be seated. Mr. Kamala, we need to hear your testimony. Amen. Amen. We need to hear your testimony. How you came. My name is Kamala Parker Jones, and I am from Greensboro originally. I've been here my entire life, and I strayed away from the church at an early age. I grew up in the church, but I strayed away from the church. The things of this world were more enticing, I thought. The things of this world began pulling at me. I knew about God, but I didn't believe in God. I had heard about Jesus, but I didn't believe in Jesus. I got caught up in alcohol. I began drinking at a young age. My parents didn't even know it. I think I started at about 14, and I drank all through college. I was literally an alcoholic. I was drunk in the street many nights all through college. My father loved me, but my father was not at home. He was an absentee father. And anybody who knows a little girl, you know that a little girl needs her father. So even though my father loved me, he wasn't there. And so I began searching for love, just like the song says, in all the wrong places. I didn't know what real love was. I only knew what the world showed me. So I learned how to fornicate. I learned how to masturbate. I learned how to defile others with my mouth. I learned all of those things which are an abomination to God. I did those things because I didn't love myself. And I didn't know that there was a savior that loved me better than my parents could love me, better than anybody on earth, a boyfriend, a husband could ever love me. And I didn't know that. So at 15, before I even got to college, I tried to kill myself. I had been abused. I've been sexually abused, and my parents didn't know it. I was too ashamed to talk about it. I found myself in strange places the older I got, with strange people and strange body odors on me that I couldn't escape. And the more I tried to go forward, the more the enemy fought me in my mind and told me things like, you're not worth living. Nobody cares about you. Nobody is going to listen to you. You're just a waste. And I began to believe those things. I had a teaching career in Athens, Georgia. I stayed there for four years, and I was drunk every one of those years. I spent my weekends and my weekdays doing something called bar hopping. I would go from bar to bar to bar. I would drink and drink and drink and then drive back to my city where I was living from Atlanta and wake up and go to school and teach other people's children. That's how bad the devil had my mind. 
I was trying to drown my pity. I was trying to drown my sorrows. I did not know there was a savior that loved me and I didn't have to live like that. So about the fourth year, I had some complications and some run-ins with my principal because my mouth was defiled. I was rebellious, I was strong in the wrong way, and I didn't have respect for authority. So I spoke my mind without thinking first. I didn't care who heard me, I said what I said and I meant what I said. So I ended up leaving that job, I had to leave. And I came home, back home to Greensboro, when I got home, I started the same old habits. Because I cashed in my teacher retirement, I had money to spend. I didn't need a job because my father owned a restaurant, he owned apartment buildings, he owned a subdivision. So I worked as he told me to. And then I clubbed throughout the week. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and if the club had been open on Sunday, I would have been there. I would lay with anybody that would have me because I was hurting so bad on the inside and I didn't know how to get out. Well, I had an aunt that worked at the restaurant with us and she would talk to me about going to church I would get so agitated. There was a revival going on at our home church that week. My mom had been asking me to come back to church. I don't want to go back to church. I don't care, leave me alone. Well, we got a new pastor. I don't care nothing about no new pastor. I'm not going over there. You know what I'm going to do, so leave me alone. I was extremely rebellious. I had a foul mouth and a nasty attitude everywhere I went. I was an embarrassment to my parents. Well, this particular night, my auntie's mouth was in my ear again before I got off work. And she said, Pamela, you should go. You know you like singing. You know you like music. You should go over there and just see what the choir sounds like. I said, I don't care. Stop talking to me about church. I'm not going to church. I was very angry, very agitated. So I did my normal. I went to the mall. I bought a shortest skirt I could find, the biggest hoop earrings I could find, the shiniest red lipstick I could find because I needed to be seen. I needed somebody to pay attention to me. I got to the ABC store. I bought my rum. I bought my scotch. And I bought my gin, and I drank the rum before I got to where I was going because I wanted to feel that buzz before I got into the club. So on the way, driving with alcohol in my system, I was probably about 25, I think I was 25, and I heard the voice again, come on. You should stop by the church. This time the voice was softer, but more direct, very firm and very persistent in my ear. I didn't know why I was hearing this. I'm thinking it's the wrong man. I'm not doing that. I'm driving. I see the church coming closer. I'm approaching the church. Before I realize it, I turn into the church. Woo! I turned into the church and I said, well, I do like music. I do like singing. And I was very arrogant. Let me see what they got. Let me see if they can sing like I can sing. Can't nobody sing like I can sing. I'm going up in there. Let me show them who I am. When I got in there, there was no choir, but there was a preacher. And he was talking to me. I sat in the back, prepared to leave early because I was going to meet my sister and my cousin 
at the club. This pastor was ordained by God to be there that night for me. I remember the day to this day. It was October 25. October 25. I was 25 years old. And this was 1995. So the pastor said, if you've ever been hurt, just stand on your feet. We're going to pray. If you've never been lied to, just stand on your feet. We're going to pray. If you've never been mistreated or abused or talked about, come on, stand up. We're going to pray. Before I realized there was a feeling on the inside of me that I could not explain, nor could I deny. I began to shake. Tears began to roll down my face because I had just broken it off with some other man. I don't know who it was. And then I stood up because I'm telling myself, I do need prayer. I know what I'm about to do. I know I'm about to go back out here. I go get drunk and I'm going to lay with somebody else until I feel satisfied, until I don't feel that pain anymore. And I stood on my feet and I began rocking back and forth. And then I felt this presence come over me. When I closed my eyes to pray, I don't really remember hearing anything else after that. I felt this love that I've never ever felt, not even from my mother who loves me, not from my daddy who loves me, not even from my uncles and my aunts, my sister, my grandma who loved me. This was a love that I had never ever experienced. And it touched me in the core of my soul when I opened my eyes, I was at the front of the sanctuary. I was on my knees and I had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior. I remember looking to the left and there was a young lady I did not recognize. I looked to my right and there was a gentleman who was the son of one of the pastors in the church and I knew he was addicted to crack cocaine. And he looked at me and shrugged his shoulders like, we here now. I couldn't believe it. For a moment, I was startled. I turned around and looked behind me. Everybody was clapping and cheering. I was like, oh no, I'm not supposed to be here. That's what I said on the inside. But the love of God that I felt that night has never gone away. And he's been with me ever since. Have I made mistakes since then? Yes. Have I been perfect? No. But we serve a God who loves us no matter how far we stray. He loves us no matter how wrong we've been. As long as we come to him as we are, he accepts us. He accepts us. And he takes your life and he changes you and he places his hand upon you and you are no more the same but you are changed forever and it is all for the glory of god and you get the benefit amen amen glory to god that's my testimony amen if any man be in christ if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So you see, Kamala, Sister Kamala is a new creation. And since then, what has the Lord actually done for you? What has he done for you? Because during those times, a lot of things were messed up, mm -hmm. even in your, body. your body. Mm -hmm. What has the Lord done? The, 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 the world has been dear world. When God changes your life, yes. what is able to change? Because I fornicated so much and because I was living in sin, I do believe that I was not able to carry children. I had a lot of dis disease in my body. I had tumors in my body and I could not carry children. Even after marrying, even after being saved, I lost three babies. I couldn't carry a child to term. I carried one baby for five months and she was stillborn. 
I lost my baby at five weeks, but God delivered me from barrenness. I now have three beautiful, healthy, strong children. Amen. God delivered me from migraine headaches because of the alcohol I used to drink. I had migraine headaches. I had ulcers because of the alcohol I used to drink. I was literally killing myself. I even had a sexual disease where the doctor told me whips were gonna come out on my body if I ever even had children, that it would never leave my system. I am now delivered. I stand before you healed and whole by the blood of Jesus. God has since given me a home, cars, love in my life, a secure family, and a relationship with him that I can't deny. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Sister, I, I really thank God. I appreciate you for being very, very honest. There's one particular thing that plagues a lot of youth, the young boys and young girls. But in the Christian realm, and they, are, they live that kind of love. And that has to do with this sin called masturbation. Now you were talking about the fact that you were masturbating, is that right? I did. And there are so many young girls today, so many. And if you are in that kind of lifestyle, you heard what the Lord delivered them from, and you better yield your life to Christ. Let's stop living the lie. You know, let's stop living the lie. When the privacy of wherever you are. You start playing with yourself and you walk outside and you pretend that you are a saint. God sees all of that. And our sister has shed light on all this. That once she was there, those boys and those girls who are dabbling in those, that aspect of lifestyle, this is the time for you to repent. Most churches will not preach this. They will not talk about it. But these are the little things that one day the Lord will say, I never was. Knew you. I never knew you. Because when you were practicing them in the secret, He saw you. God saw you. There are so many who are wasting tears on the pulpit and the altars, crying for babies, so they know what they've been doing. When we talk against abortion, masturbation is also abortion. Because you destroy, it's an, you destroy the seed before even it germinates. We don't talk about it in the church. We have so many young girls singing in the choir and doing all kinds of things, living this lifestyle. Before even they come to church, they've already done it. And the Lord reveals these things. City of Greensboro, you heard a testimony of the Kama. How it was that the Lord delivered her, and you also he will deliver you. He will deliver you. The Lord delivered her. Today she has three children. Today she can say that I am a new creation, the handiwork of God. That spirit of masturbation is a strong spirit. When it gets hold of you, it is difficult to break away from. And if you if, if you are practicing it, you need to be delivered. Hallelujah. You need to be delivered. In fact, there are old folks even doing the same thing. Not only young boys and young girls, old folks play with themselves. The spirit of masturbation, it has no respect of persons. Elderly people doing it, and young girls and young boys doing it. And for me, as the Lord has called me, I will not hide anything. It is true, and we need to confess it, we need to expose it, and we need to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. So our young girls and young boys, should the Lord call them in their youth, the Lord will not say, I never knew you, just because they've been living in this secret sin. Hallelujah. Can you put that finger, nail thing away? 
and pay attention to the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Sister Kamala, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord grant the grace with it. Uh, it looks like I'm, 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 I'm going to exhaust you. So you need to read for us as well. Before you go to sleep, uh, I don't know. No, go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> Proverbs 23 and from verse 29. Please. please stand for the reading of the word. We're reading from the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, starting at verse 29. Woe. Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a nest. They have stricken me. Shalt thou say, and I was not sick? They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I read the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verses 29 to 35. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be said, please. Hallelujah. Didn't our hearts burn at the testimony of our beloved sister? She shed light on the places that she has been. Hallelujah. And every one of us has a skeleton in our lives. Every one of us. The one thing that the Lord will have us to do is to be very sincere and open. The word of God says that if we sin, we confess our faults one to another. It is better to expose sin than to hide it and on that day when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he will say, away from me, I never knew you. Hell is eternity. City of Greensboro, hell is eternity. That is why Satan does not want the churches to preach it that much. So whenever you talk about hell, the media comes hard on you and said you are a hell fire and brimstone preacher as if that is an anantima but hell is real hell is real paul seeing that says seeing that we are encircled or we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight that that easily beset us. Little it says everyone weight. Those things again, as I'm talking about, our young girls and our young boys, from as low as early age as six, even four. Some of them are being introduced to it in the school. And others are watching it online. And they are practicing it. They are digging a hole for them. Eternal hole. Hell is real. And so that is why there is a need for us to repent and turn from this hideous sin called masturbation, 
Fornication. Hello? Yes. Fornication. Yes. Fornication. Jesus Christ went as far as saying that if you look at a woman, a young girl or a young boy, lustfully, you are fornicated with him or her in your heart. That is what Jesus Christ said. That is why there is the need for us to purify ourselves. That is why your pastor always urges you spend time in prayer, fast, seek your face. When I was in high school, I soon said that. I was fasting constantly. Why? Even though it was a boys' school, I need to seek the face of God constantly on fasting. And then when I went to St. Augustine's College, in Raleigh, St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, you are surrounded by so many beautiful young ladies. Everyone looking for the next man or boy that you would like onto. Which means that I have to make sure that every week, three times in a week, I was before the Lord, three days of fasting, no food, no water. Praying, seeking God's face for divine protection so that I will not soil myself or stain my garment in the college. Amen. It is important, it is very, very important that we sanctify, we separate ourselves. Why am I touching on this thing so much? Because it has become so prevalent. Hollywood pushes it. Hollywood glorifies it. And the media also glorifies it. Commercials and on and on and on. You have a child in your home and you don't know that that child is hoodwinked by that spirit. It is a demonic spirit. And that, that spirit will lead every one of us that don't turn from that sin. It will lead you to hell. Hell is real. And hell is no respecter of your age. No matter how young you are, if you are doubling in this sin, hell's door is open and will receive you. But Jesus Christ offers redemption. Yes. Jesus Christ offers what? Redemption. redemption. Yes. And you better surrender to him today. Yes. If you are in the city of Greensboro, in the county of Greyford, in the state of North Carolina, in the nation of America, and for those of you who have been pushing this evil upon the children, the Bible says, if anyone will cause any one of the little children to sin, it will be best for them to hang around their neck a millstone and be cast into the bottom of the ocean. That is how serious it is. So when people glorify in sin, and they glorify in sin, and they glorify in sin, and they laugh at it. Just recently I was watching, there are somebody that sent me a WhatsApp. The members of parliament in my country, my beloved country, were making a joke, a fan of that which is so perverted. Perverse. So I had to write a strong note to them. That it's a shame how it is that our streets are lying dilapidated, need attention, and they will occupy themselves with speaking things that are inordinate in a high place like a parliament. Does it make sense? And that is the same way it covers all over. Adults who are supposed to be adults are acting less than children and pushing children into, uh, uh, into eternal domination. All because of money. All because of what? Money. The scripture tonight is that who has woes? Who has woes? Who has woes? Who has woes? Who has depression? Who has stress? Who is suffering from clinical depression? Who has no joy? Who has no peace in his life? Whose life is filled with chaos? So who has who has much sorrow? Who has contention? So we are talking about these things that the Lord is saying are prevalent in the lives of many, both in this city, in this state, in this nation, and in the world at large. People are filled with woes, they are filled with sorrow, they are filled with contentions, 
They are filled with babbling. They have wounds without cause. And they have redness all over their eyes and their faces. The question is, who has all these things? And we can find them not too far away from us. They that tarry low at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. It doesn't make sense how it is that you will work from Monday through Friday. You work hard. And as soon as your paycheck comes to you, the first thing that comes into your mind are texts of beer and bottles of wine. What are you saying to yourself? Well, I've worked hard, I'm tired, I have to reward myself. That is foolishness. Having worked so hard, do you want to overwork your liver and your kidney also? With wine and with beer? Does it make sense? But that is what Satan does. He has taken captive so many and is riding us as horses and donkeys. And every instant when he whips, when he pulls the cord, he whips, you find yourself galloping. Galloping either to the place where you can find beer or galloping to the place where you can have strong drinks and mixed drinks. And so many of us, we are experts at that. And we speak glowingly about it. In the meantime, as you imbibe those things into your body, those things that are also are chemi chemically very addictive. Yeah. And they are very, very corrosive. Wine has a corrosive effect. And they go to work on your kidney, they will go to work on your liver. Before you find you have cancer of the liver, cirrhosis of the liver, and also of your lungs, and also of your kidney. Now you begin to cry and say, Pastor, can you pray for me? Yeah. When the word of God was not proclaimed, what did you do with the word of God? The Bible says that he who is often corrected, Proverbs 29 verse 1, he who is often corrected but hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed without remedy. City of Greensboro, you've heard us countless number of weeks proclaiming the word of God in this place. That we ought to repent from our wicked ways and turn to Jesus Christ, the only Redeemer and Savior. You heard Sister Kamala has made a statement. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, as long as you admit that you, have, you need deliverance and you come as you are, Jesus Christ is able to deliver you and is able to wash you and make you whole. In fact, Jesus Christ is able to repair your damaged kidney and your damaged liver and restore you unto newness. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The book of Ezekiel chapter 6 also says the same. That in that day you will call upon me and I will answer you. I will sprinkle you with pure water. I will remove your stony heart and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And I will cause you to walk in my ways. And you look back on your former life. And will hate it with a perpetual hatred. That is that spirit that is working in the heart of Sister Kamala today. She looks back at her former life. She does not rejoice in it, but rather she hates it with a perpetual hatred because those are the days when she was kept in bondage. No joy, no peace. She was living a life of chaos. Her eyes were filled with redness. Why? Because she tarried long at the wine. She was moving from bar to bar. But today she moves from church to church. Now, not talking about from church to church, dropping the blood, but she was constantly in the house of God because of the Lord was redeemed him. Tonight, city of Greensboro, God is calling us unto repentance. 
God is calling us unto repentance. How we have trivialized life, and we think economy, economy, or economic gain is more important than the salvation of your soul. So we invest so much in alcoholism. It is so sad. When we know the source of the problems of the people, we still encourage wine buying. And then on the other side, we say we have uh, what do you call that drink? Uh, the A A A A what do you call it? Uh, a A A. That's alcoholic something. I don't know. Is that uh -huh. We have alcoholic beverage say that we always count in a professor and then we have alcoholic anonymous so go and drink all that you can and then if you are tired go to alcoholic anonymous where do you say anonymous when you wanted to drink you were so bold to walk into the ABC store yeah. Yeah. or for whatever you buy it. now you want to set me free you want to be anonymous We know those who manufacture the cigarette. We know how bad it is destroying the young boys and adults. Cancer and all those things. We know it. If we really are interested in the welfare of the people, all we need to do is to stop it. But we are so much interested in the economic gains more than the life of the people. So then we have another agency that we say we have a smokeless cigarette. We have this, and so we move from smoke cigarette to smokeless electronic cigarette. But every one of them has an adverse effect on the life of the people. God is calling upon us to repent, Amen. to turn away from our wicked ways. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And what shall it profit a city? What shall it profit a county? What shall it profit a state? What shall it profit a nation? What shall it profit a world? If we gain all the material goods of this world, and in the end, we, we end up being destroyed by the fiery wrath of God. But that day is coming. That day is coming. This Jesus Christ I'm talking about is real. If you heard the testimony of Sister Kamala, I have a testimony. How it was that the Lord delivered me also. How it was that the Lord healed me also. So then, that is why I will walk 20 miles a day and still not say that I am tired too tired to come and stand before you and proclaim his word. Amen. Because your soul is more important. Amen. And so the Lord has to renew my strength and give me the grace to be able to stand in front of you. Amen. America, we need Jesus Christ. City of Greenville, we need Jesus Christ. We need him in our lives. We have for too long been living in flatteries. And the one thing that God hates is flattery. Remember I talked about masturbation? We live in flattery. We will commit this sin in secret. And we flatter ourselves. And we flatter our neighbor. Making them think that we are holy. And yet we know what we are going to do. And the finger of God is upon you. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Yeah. And that is a, a fact. Yes. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. Verse 30. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. God's word is saying, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it starts fermenting. Look not upon the wine when it is fermented. But don't you know that that is what we want? Fermented wine? And we have all the excuses and the justifications that we make for drinking wine. So many have changed their 
our first name, our last name to Timothy. I'm talking about believers, people who go to church. They change their last name to Timothy. Even bishops, apostles, reverend fathers, and father reverends, we offer it in communion. And we say, Timothy drank it. So, and is your name Timothy? When Paul says, drink wine, remember it says, look not upon the wine when it's what? Fermented. So it means that there is a, there's a wine that is not what? Fermented. It is a sweet wine. But we quote Timothy. And we go to church and we have communion. We drink ourselves to drunken stupor. And we justify that. No wonder when we come down with cirrhosis of the liver. Cancer eating your liver. Because of your love for strong drink and your love for wine. Now you want to ask God to heal you. Hallelujah. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it gives his color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. Solomon is one person that you and I have to pay him to. Because he lived all this life. He tried all these things and found them to vanity. He found them to be vain. They didn't help him. And so he's giving counsel to you and I. It says, at the last it will bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. Wine will bite like a serpent. Wine, when it is stinking you and is biting you, it changes your judgment. It changes your judgment. It will make you to think that the car that is coming is your best friend. And so instead of Stand out of the way you want to go and embrace the car. And there are countless number of people who have gone to embrace cars and break and embrace train and end up dying. Why causes you to begin to think about suicide? Why causes you to begin to think about suicide? How? When you have that, what do you call it? After the after effect of the wine. You, you are so depressed, you go and drink the wine, go back to sleep, and the morning comes and you have a hangover. You have a hangover, You're, you are filled with deep misery and sadness. And what do you do? You begin to think about things. And you want to test your life. Some decide to go and lie on the railway track. Others go to hang themselves. Others take gun and shoot themselves. Others dive into the way of an 18-wheeler truck. Others will drive their car to the higher peak and pull down and go down the steep and die. Others will go over the bridge, dive either into the water or drive into the water. And some will carry their children to this destruction. And the sad part of it is that we have churches that are saying that when you commit suicide, you will not go to hell. So there are people who are committing suicide by the number, thinking they'll go to heaven. My friend, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. Jesus Christ came to deliver us and to set us free. There is nothing in this life that when you bring to Jesus Christ, he is not able to handle and solve for you. So when you commit suicide, you are telling Jesus Christ, you are not savior, you cannot save me. And that is an insult to God. Hallelujah. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine eyes will say, behold strange men. When you are an alcoholic,